Well, thank you. It's great to be here at R.J. Julia, a wonderful independent bookstore, a dying but essential breed. And I can tell you, as both a writer and a reader, stores like this play a role that can't be duplicated anywhere else. So thank you. Uh, World War II was, of course, the first war in which science and scientists played a central and vital role. The Manhattan Project, the thousands of physicists and other scientists who developed the atomic bomb was the most dramatic and well-known illustration of this. Probably a close second, and I think today probably almost as well-known are the were the thousands of mathematicians and other scientific workers at Bletchley Park in England and in Washington, D.C., who broke the German Enigma, Cipher, and other access codes. Patrick Blackett, hardly a household name, and the very small group of British and American scientists who really turned the tide in the battle against the U-boats are not so nearly well known at all. But their contribution uh, was, I think, every bit as vital, not only in winning one of the most crucial battles in the war against Nazi Germany, but also for its lasting consequences in revolutionizing the very way military commanders think about war. For that matter, revolutionizing the way quantitative analysis could be applied to a host of practical problems in uh, the business world through the new science Patrick Blackett and his colleagues created during the war, operational research or operations research. And so it's their story that I've tried to tell in, in my book, Blackett's War. The war of the U-boats was the one threat that Churchill worried could bring Britain to its knees even after the danger of seaborne invasion faded following the RAF's heroic defense against the Luftwaffe uh, in the Battle of Britain during the summer of 1940. Britain crucially depended on imports not only for oil, steel, war materiel, but just to stay alive. The country was a net importer of food and by the start of 1941, the U-boats had already sunk enough shipping to reduce imports below the 31 million tons a year it needed to just maintain essential food supplies for the civilian population. The crunch of the whole war, Churchill wrote to Roosevelt at the end of 1940, rests in the Atlantic. The decision for 1941, he wrote, lies upon the seas. And Churchill, after the war, in his memoirs, would write, the Battle of the Atlantic was the dominating factor all through the war. Never for one moment could we forget that everything happening elsewhere on land, sea, or in the air depended ultimately on its outcome. So in the spring of 1940, excuse me, thank you. So um, in the spring of 1941, in the face of mounting losses at sea, Churchill issued a somewhat uh, grandiloquent, I guess you could say Churchillian order to, quote, take the offensive against the U-boats. And it was in this dire crisis point of the war that Patrick Blackett was given the job of putting together a small group of scientists at Britain's Coastal Command to see if he could come up with some ways of improving their heretofore dismal performance in locating and attacking the German submarines that were threatening to cut Britain's vital lifeline. Blackett was at this time one of the world's most prominent experimental physicists. He had an extraordinary background. He'd been a naval cadet, and as an 18-year-old midshipman saw action at the Battle of Jutland aboard a battleship in World War I, after the war, the Navy decided that all of these cadets, cadets in, in Britain at that time started at age 14 and uh, at age 18 they graduated and went into the uh, Navy as midshipmen. Um, but the, the Navy had had to rush this last class right into war with the start of World War I, so they thought to make up for the loss in interruption of their education, they would send them all to universities for six months just to sort of round out their education. Blackett was sent to Cambridge, and within a few weeks of arriving there, 
Uh, he said, one day I wandered over to the famous Cavendish Laboratory, one of the world's leading physics laboratories, he said, to see what a scientific laboratory was like. And very shortly after that, he told the Navy, I'm leaving the Navy, I want to become a scientist. He never did receive a PhD, um, but he quickly became one of the world's foremost physicists for the work he did in the 1930s discovering the positron, the positive electron, the first piece of antimatter whose existence was confirmed. He would win the Nobel Prize in physics in 1948. He was good looking, had a commanding presence, had an extraordinary combination of hands-on ability and uh, theoretical imagination. His colleagues remarked they'd never known anyone his equal in his ability to conceive of a problem in physics, write out a few lines of mathematics, design an apparatus, build it himself, carry out the experiment, analyze the results. He was also one of a number of scientists in Britain and America who had been working hard behind the scenes in the 1930s to prepare for war and to try to make sure that the Army and Navy made full use of science when it came. He was frustrated no end by what he found to be the typical attitude of military commanders, which was not only that a bunch of civilian intellectuals could not tell them how to run a war, um, but more specifically that the only role of scientists and other technical men was just produce some new gadget or weapon or gizmo, hand it over to the military, and then not concern themselves with anything beyond that. But Black had argued that war itself its tactics and strategy and operations was a series of actions directed at more or less definite ends. And so to quote him, the use of these weapons and the organization of the men who handle them are at least as much scientific problems as is their production. What he was arguing for was what would become the genesis of operations research. Today, it's a fundamental component of military thinking, something every student at West Point in the Naval Academy studies, and indeed every student in business school. Then it was revolutionary. Military commanders thought that tactical and strategic planning, in particular, was an art that was learned through experience and judgment, and they bridled at the idea of civilian intellectuals butting their nose in. But several astonishing insights that Blackett's very small team achieved early on changed their minds. Probably the most dramatic was a simple but counterintuitive calculation the scientists made showing that the tactics the Navy had ordered its air crews to follow in attacking U-boats, uh, even though it seemed like a perfectly sensible approach on its face, was in fact unlikely ever to successfully sink a U-boat. Uh, the Navy commanders had actually done a seemingly reasonable calculation themselves. They knew uh, how much time typically elapsed between the moment a, a patrol plane spotted a U-boat and the U-boat spotted the approaching patrol plane and dove be, uh, beneath the surface. And um, they knew how fast a U-boat could dive, and so they multiplied. Uh, they knew it was about... 45 seconds that a U-boat typically had been out of sight by the time the patrol plane actually got in a position to drop a depth charge. Uh, and they figured uh, a U-boat could have gotten down to 150 feet below the surface by that point. So they said, OK, set the depth charges to explode at 150 feet. That's the best average. Um, the trouble was, as Blackett scientists realized once they started sifting through this data, was that a U-boat that had been out of sight for 45 seconds also had time to take evasive action left or right. And so even though the depth charges were probably exploding at the right depth on average, they were almost always in the wrong place. And so were missing their targets. And in fact, the results were positively dismal. Um, fewer than 1% of all sighted U-boats were being successfully attacked. The scientists proposed an incredibly simple change that involved no new equipment or new manpower or anything else. They said, change the depth setting on the depth charges from 150 feet to 25 feet. Only attack U-boats that had been out of sight for less than 15 seconds. 
That would ensure that when they did carry out an attack, the target would be both at the right depth and the right place because U-boats caught in this small